Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for an MP webinar covering employee discipline and termination, how to reduce risk and ensure compliance. I'm Katie Kreider, Marketing Specialist here at MP. For those of you joining us on a webinar for the first time, MP is a full service human capital management company. We offer a complete suite of products and services to support organizations through the entire employee life cycle, including recruiting, HR, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance assistance. We support our clients with cutting edge technical solutions, as well as a proactive, reliable service and a deep HR and payroll expertise. At MP, we are wired for HR and help our clients succeed by aligning their people strategy with their business goals. I'm super excited to introduce your presenter for today's program, Donnie Pengburn. Donnie has a fundamental certification through SHRM he has over 15 years of experience in human resource management with an emphasis on employee and leadership development, talent acquisition, benefits administration, and employee relations. Donnie has passionately mentored many interns seeking a career in human resources and is an advocate of continuing education. Donnie earned his bachelor's of education with an emphasis in orchestral wind ensemble music. He has spent numerous years in a human resource management role within call contact centers, law firms, and the healthcare industry prior to joining MP. Donnie's goal is to obtain his SPHR certification by 2022 year end. And just a few quick housekeeping issues before we get started here today. If you would like to submit a question during the program, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We will be sending out the recording of the webinar later today along with the slides. And one last thing, to ensure that your company is prepared for year end, I did just drop a link into the chat so you can check out MP, learn more, or book a meeting with an HR professional. And with all of that, I'm gonna hand the mic off to Donnie. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Donnie and I'm gonna be your MC. I'm gonna be your facilitator and your host for the next hour. So you want to strap yourselves in for an exciting hour about effective employee discipline. Um, if you would like a copy of this presentation, please reach out and we will be happy to provide that for you. An effective discipline program is beneficial to both the employer and the employee. It helps employees correct any shortcomings with the goal of becoming a valuable contributing um, member of the workforce and documentation created as a result of the disciplinary process can also help protect an employer in the event that a termination or other adverse employment decision becomes necessary. It's useful to view the matter of discipline as having several components, um, issues that must be addressed before administering discipline, methods of disciplining, including progressive discipline, how to provide employees with an opportunity to, to respond to discipline, such as a grievance program, and then laws um, relevant to termination. So today, uh, the topics that, we'll, that we will be covering are best practices. What are the most important tips to remember when discussing disciplinary action? What do those necessary forms look like? Wrongful terminations, defining those performance objectives and the most effective ways to terminate an employee. And then training, what training is best? Disciplinary action versus termination, deciding which is more appropriate. And then what about a performance improvement plan or a PIP? We'll also take a look at what a termination meeting should look like. And also what are the legal considerations we should take into account? And then last but not least, social media concerns. We'll talk about protected concerted activities um, and we'll also provide some examples as well. So without further ado, grab your coffee. Let's get rolling. So the first topic that we're gonna tackle is best practices. Many employers, faced with responding to wrongful termination, discrimination, retaliation, or related complaints, they're going to lack the requisite documentation to support disciplinary actions. Documenting employee misconduct and performance issues can support future adverse employment decisions. 
and show that the employer took the necessary and appropriate steps to address and correct any performance or disciplinary issues. So let's take a look at some of those best practices for documenting disciplinary actions. All right, so we have a golden rule. So here's the golden rule. Employee discipline should always be fair, consistent, job-related, and it should be documented. And before any type of discipline or progressive discipline should be initiated, ask yourself if a strategy can be developed that would correct the problem rather than forcing it into a progressive kind of disciplinary model, if you will. Some tips on those effective behavioral-based coaching is going to include, you know, fix the actual problem. If an incident is due to an honest mistake, not a reckless mistake, the three strikes and you're out mentality doesn't apply very well. And we all know that. So by addressing why the incident occurred, managers can discover the root of the problem and fix it. For example, a driver performing a process incorrectly can lead to safety issues. We're not performing a thorough enough pre-trip inspection. However, if their instructions on how to complete that process were unclear, management can address the problem at the root cause to prevent it from happening again. We also want to build a foundation of trust. You know, the words discipline and coaching, they're going to evoke very different reactions um, for obvious reasons. One indicates penalties, while the other suggests a learning opportunity. And some employees could become defensive or evasive if they think honest mistakes will be held against them as severely as purposeful misconduct. We want to maintain a good morale. Progressive discipline is a blind, zero-tolerance approach to workplace incidents. However, it solely depends upon the severity of the infraction. It doesn't take into consideration previous good conduct or tenure. This is problematic because valuable, experienced employees may consider looking for a new employer if they suddenly, you know, they're slapped with a first strike, put on notice, for future dis disciplinary action after years of uh, well otherwise stellar service. Coaching avoids this problem and allows for a scaled, reasonable response to incidents. We want to provide managers, obviously, with more authority over those risks. So some incidents are enough to warrant immediate termination. However, depending upon the workplace handbook, managers may be adhering to an outdated progressive discipline model. This means that they have to muddle through several potentially dangerous repeat violations when one strike should be the only strike. Let's talk a little bit about that form. So we want to have a disciplinary form, obviously. So we, we want to make sure that we have a structured form in place. And such a form like this is it's going to make your documenting employee misconduct easier for yourself, for your managers, your supervisors, and it ensures a uniform process. A pre-printed fill-in-the-blank form should, among other things, have spaces for basic information regarding the employee, the time and date of the incident, a description of the incident for which the employee is being disciplined, the specific policy or work rule that was violated, and the action that will be taken against the employee. Make sure that the information is legible and that the person who is completing the form both prints and signs their name on the form so that if follow-up is necessary, you'll know who to contact. So when we talk about investigations, you know, before an employer decides to discipline the employee, you know, there should be a full and fair investigation of the events. I hope everyone agrees. In certain circumstances, though, it may be appropriate to have someone other than the employee's direct manager or direct supervisor conduct that investigation 
or review the discipline decision. If there were witnesses to the misconduct, those witnesses should be interviewed. The person conducting the investigation should include on the employee discipline, discipline form the names of any witnesses and note um, on a separate document what they had to say. Sometimes information from other sources may lead us to reconsider whether disciplinary action is really appropriate. We also want to get the facts. So for employee discipline documentation to actually even be effective, it's got to be factual. The goal in completing such documentation is that anyone who might read the employee discipline form will receive a clear picture of what happened and why the discipline was imposed. We also want to be objective. And in completing the form, it's important that the manager be objective in describing the incident. The manager supervisor should describe the conduct that led to the discipline rather than the attitude of the employee or the manager's personal views of the employee. One of the most important tips to remember when gathering facts is to be sure to leave out any opinions or feelings during the process. Opinions and feelings may ultimately lead to potential discrimination accusations. We want to be specific and we want to be clear. So when completing the form, it's important to set forth the facts in special or specific detail. The manager should clearly state what the employee did that violated a company policy or work rule. So for example, managers should say that the employee, or shouldn't say that the employee is lazy, but should describe the facts that have led to the conclusion. For example, Mr. Jones failed to arrive at the work site on time for seven consecutive days. Mr. Jones left the site early on each of those days the work that was assigned to Mr. Jones by the supervisor was not completed on any of the days that Jones worked. The more specific factual details that you can provide and record on that form, the better it's going to be. And if there is not enough space, obviously, to provide it on that form, then you can just attach additional pages. One of my favorites, don't wait. Complete the form while the facts are fresh in your mind. The memory of an event is clear right after the event, as opposed to hours, days, or even months later. We as leaders, we should complete the employee discipline form as soon as possible after the misconduct occurred so that their recollections will be clear. Many times we as leaders, we maneuver from one task to another, and at times it can, be, it can be very swift. But be sure to allow yourself time to sit in a quiet, private space to recollect the specific events that took place during the actual experience. It is possible to leave out pertinent facts if we wait too long to document the series of events that took place. And there's the wonderful acknowledgement. So we as leaders, we should make sure that um, the employee reviews the completed form um, with the employee and make sure that the employee signs that form. Such an acknowledgement does show that the employee has been told that his, their action was a violation of a company policy or work rule and prevents the employee from claiming in the future that he did not know of that specific problem. It's important to convey to the employee that signing the document is not an admission of guilt, but to ensure we have record that a discussion was had and the employee is crystal clear why the meeting is taking place. So in the event that the employee refuses to sign the form, well, 
we should note that on the form and record the date. In addition, um, we as leaders who heard the refusal should also sign the form as well if you have a witness. We definitely wanna listen. Allow the employee to explain the conduct. Record the employee's version of the events on the form. While the explanation may not alter the discipline that is being imposed, it does allow the employee to tell their side of the story. And it also helps to preserve the employee's version of events in the event they change um, their account in the future. Allow the employee to document in a safe space without feeling any pressure or tension. We want to be fair. You know, managers and supervisors will undoubtedly have different relationships with different employees. It's a fact. Um, they will like some, and we may just tolerate others. However, we as managers and supervisors, we need to be fair and uniform in imposing disciplinary action regardless of who is being disciplined. If necessary, human resources may want to review the organization's employee handbook with their managers and supervisors on a periodic basis to ensure that they're familiar with the policies and are uniformly enforcing them. Discrimination in the disciplinary process is unlawful, of course, but it can also ruin employees' respect for their employer to say nothing of damaging the organization's reputation. This alone could have a detrimental effect on the overall morale and culture of the organization if complete fairness is not visible. I know this is going to be difficult at times to do, but always try to make this a positive experience. Well, how do I do that when I'm administering disciplinary action? That sounds crazy. So to the extent that it is possible, use your disciplinary process as a positive experience. Well, that sounds insane. I don't get it. What do you mean? Well, while the responsibility is on the employee to improve their conduct, we may want to offer a reasonable solution to help. So with some employees, it may be beneficial to map out some definitive next steps the employee will take to improve conduct in the future. However, remember that if you're going to offer one employee an improvement plan, such plans must be available for all employees who are having performance problems. Again, it's a matter of uniformity in this disciplinary process. An open dialogue with the employee may allow the employee to see the infraction themselves and provide their own solution when realizing that behavior or performance was unacceptable. Let's talk about wrongful terminations. So sooner or later, you know, every business is going to have to deal with an employee claiming that they were wrongfully terminated from their job. The, reali the reality is that employers usually terminate employees for performance or due to maybe even downsizing. Whenever you must make the business decision to terminate an employee, you should be aware that the employee may file a claim or even attempt to sue you. Your company's termination process and how it handles employees during the termination process very often has a direct impact on whether the employee decides to file a wrong termination claim against your company post-termination. Even when you have a clear termination policy and clearly communicated to the employee, um, to every employee as they join your company and allow it as the employee exits the company, a lawsuit still may follow. So one of the first things that I wanna do, I wanna define work performance objectives. So to help ensure that any type of litigation or any claims come about um, or 
If we want to mitigate that risk, we want to make sure that when the decision is made to terminate an employee, it should not be a great surprise for that employee. You know, the old cliche, an employee should never be surprised of their termination. Document the employee counseling process from warning to written warning to possible suspension, whatever your specific process is. Make sure to communicate the progressive disciplinary measures with expectations for improvement to the employee and document this in their employee file. Thus having a system to identify performance objectives and comparing an employee's individual performance against those objectives, and then communicating with the employee whether they meet or don't meet those criteria makes the actual termination for performance reasons simpler and less shocking to the employee. This is a perfect reason to have a structured process in place and visible within your employee handbook. Terminate with compassion. What's this? There's going to be pros and cons and initiating a progressive disciplinary process is gonna be no different. You know, the pros are, it's gonna provide a clear explanation of the consequences of not following the employer's rules or not meeting those expectations. It provides opportunity for consistency and fairness and disciplinary procedures for different employees. It gives the opportunity for an employee to change behaviors. This is especially true in cases where the employee may not have realized they were breaking the rules or causing a problem in the first place. It provides the employer with alternative methods to termination for minor infractions. This will improve your employee retention. It also can enhance employee morale when the employees know the employer is not going to fire them for a minor issue. Morale can also be enhanced by that knowledge that poor behavior of others will be addressed. And it provides evidence that the employer gave the employee every opportunity to improve. There are obviously some cons to that as well. And such a policy can be inflexible. HR managers, you have to make judgment calls when to deviate from the progressive steps as may be necessary when considering all circumstances. If not followed consistently for all employees, this could appear to be uh, discriminatory. This problem exists anytime different disciplinary actions are taken from different employees who have committed the same violation. It is not unique to employers using progressive discipline. The primary concern here is the potential for litigation if it occurs. Some fear that such a policy implies its steps must be followed before any termination, which could have the effect of an implied contract stating that an employee will never be terminated without these steps. The fear is that this might jeopardize the at-will status of their employment. It can be time-consuming to use in practice, especially for organizations with limited resources. And not only does the process itself take time, but it also requires training in advance, documentation during each incident, and follow-up. For some businesses, especially small organizations, it may not be practical to follow these steps as it may not be practical to keep an employee on staff who violates any rule or it may be feasible to keep the business running with a suspended employee. It just might not be practical to implement for every organization. So we wanna give employees the opportunity to participate in that problem solving process. That's gonna create compassion. It doesn't look like that you're just sitting the employee down and saying, this isn't working out, thank you very much, have a great day, let me have your badge and I'll walk to the door. What we also want to do is we want to create that paper trail to support the company in wrongful termination suits and unemployment claims. So when we talk about those claims, we probably want to think about liability insurance. Employers liability insurance, this is a coverage that's going to help pay a business owner's costs. It's going to be related to the lawsuit resulting from an employee's work-related injury or illness. Without employer's liability insurance, you'd have to pay for these legal costs out of pocket, which can, it can get really expensive. Typically this coverage is a part of a workman's compensation insurance policy, but in monopolistic states, 
business owners may have to obtain this separately. Small business owners need employer's liability insurance because it helps protect them from lawsuits related to employee work-related injuries or illnesses. And without this insurance, your business would be responsible for those legal costs, such as your attorney fees, settlements, and judgments. So how does the employer's liability coverage even work? So for most states, it requires employees to carry workers' compensation insurance. This is gonna provide employees, employees benefits to help them recover from work-related injuries or illnesses, helping cover those costs for medical bills, ongoing care, and lost wages. However, employees can sue their employees if they feel like the workers' compensation benefits were inadequate. This is where employer's liability insurance comes in. If an employee sues their employer, it can help cover the legal costs. In most cases, employer's liability coverage is part of a workers' compensation policy. But for employers in that monopolistic states who get workers' compensation coverage through the state fund, employer's liability insurance isn't included in their policy. The business in these four states must buy a separate policy are going to be North Dakota, Ohio, Washington, and Wyoming. And then there's ELPI. Employment practice is liability insurance. This is gonna be different from your employer's liability insurance because EPLI is gonna help protect a business owner from employment related claims, such as wrongful termination, discrimination, harassment, the employer's liability coverage helps protect a business owner from lawsuits and claims related to an employee injury or illness due to their work. Well, you may ask, how do I even get um, ELPI? Well, many business owners will find employer's liability insurance in their workman's compensation insurance policy. Uh, but if you have workman's comp coverage through a state fund, you can get the employer's liability insurance as a separate policy. And you can typically get that coverage by adding an endorsement to your general liability insurance policy. Training. <laughs> Training is vital. And we've got to make sure that we have a disciplinary form and process in place. You know, such a form is going to make documenting employment's conduct easier for everyone. And it ensures that uniform process. That pre-printed fill-in-the-blank form should, among other things, have spaces for basic information, like I said before, regarding the employee, like the time, the date of the incident, you know, the description of the incident for which employee is being disciplined, the specific policy or work rule that was violated, and then what's the action that's going to be taken. We've got to make sure that information is legible and that the person who's completing the form both prints and signs. And when we wanna train our team, um, it's gonna be our role as leaders to train new managers on progressive disciplinary processes and why they should use them. And here's why progressive discipline is essential. It helps new managers conquer discrimination and retaliation claims. It gives new managers objectivity and fairness in the disciplinary process. It encourages supervisor employee openness in communication conceivably boosts employee retention by settling the problem and presents extensive documentation should termination become inevitable. <laughs> we all know that knowledge is power and discipline in the workplace has a pivotal role to play in any organization. And when used correctly and fairly, where appropriate, disciplinary measures can ensure that employers, customers, suppliers, and employees are going to be protected from any misconduct that may occur within the workplace. So is it going to be disciplinary action or should I move to termination? You know, although your company may be an outlined schedule of progressive discipline, different situations may warrant different consequences. And inconsistency with those consequences from employee to employee may appear discriminatory. Add to that the complexities of human feelings and emotions, 
and suddenly you're reconsidering your choice of a profession. While there's no one size fits all consequence for every behavior, here are some situations that may require corrective action versus some that may warrant immediate termination. Inappropriate removal of possession of property, working under the influence, disruptive or boisterous activities, negligence, minor insubordination, violation of safety or health rules, employee harassment, absence without notice, unauthorized use of company equipment, disclosure of confidential information, violation of company policies, unsatisfactory performance or conduct. Now, these are some examples of infractions that may lead into some form of disciplinary action. However, keep in mind that depending upon the severity of the infraction, some of these listed above may be serious enough to move straight into that potential termination. And so when we think about that, um, a specific part of that disciplinary process, you know, you may think about a, a performance improvement plan or a PIP, if you will. So part of that disciplinary process may be to go ahead and just map out the specifics and measurable items that we as leaders that we'd observe and track to ensure that the employee is rerouted to success. A performance improvement plan should include the description of performance discrepancy, the description of expected performance, the plan of action, and we want to make sure that we state specific goals. The time frame for improvement. Are we going to check in with them every Friday? Is it going to be bi-weekly? We want a description of what those consequences could potentially be if improvement, um, we don't see any type of improvement. And then of course, again, we want to make sure that there are signatures from the employee and those leaders who initiated the PIP. And so when we think about a performance improvement plan or why someone may be placed on a performance improvement plan, um, I provided some examples here. Um, these are some infractions, like I said, they could potentially be grounds for termination or Depending upon how serious the, the infraction is, you, you know, you may want to initiate some type of pro progressive disciplinary uh, process with that employee um, if it's related to insubordination. Maybe it's a breach of confidentiality, a destruction, destruction of property, um, dishonesty or theft, falsification of records, disorderly conduct, threats of violence or harassment. You know, when I first take a look at this list, I think to myself, well, gosh, some of these I would think I would just immediately terminate the employee. But you know what? It's going to be on a case-to-case -case basis. And that's what we as leaders always need to remember. It's not always going to be cut and dry. Situations can get tricky. Situations can get sticky. Um, so it's going to be based upon that specific incident. If we're leading towards termination, you know, the last resort when performance or behavior has not improved or the severity of the incident warrants immediate dismissal. Um, we want to be aware of state specific requirements for involuntary terminations, such as their final pay, do they, should they receive a letter, um, and any unemployment information. Any termination can bring the risk of claims of wrongful termination or discrimination, regardless if you've dotted every I and crossed every T. So when you're meeting with an employee regarding potential termination, here are some rules to follow. So we wanna conduct the termination in private and schedule at a time that reduces embarrassment for the employee. When possible, you wanna have HR or another leader present during terminations. Secure or arrange for the return of any keys, equipment, electronics, identification, and other company property. You wanna arrange for the removal of the employee's personal belongings from the workplace. And the employee should immediately leave the premises at the conclusion of that meeting. You also want to check your state and local laws to ensure you're being compliant when issuing an employee termination. 
there are going to be some legal considerations, obviously. So employees or employers should be mindful of these following federal laws in, in, in employment decisions, but most importantly, in decisions to terminate their employment, um, such as um, USERA, the Uniform Service Employment and Reemployment Rights Act, um, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, your Pregnancy Discrimination Act, the ADA Americans with Disabilities Act, or Age Discrimination in Employment Act. Remember also that Equal Opportunity or Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, your EEOC, is the one who enforces federal laws prohibiting discrimination. Other legal considerations, um, they can include disparate treatment, discrimination that's generally intentional and is based on an applicant or employee membership in a protected group or class. Disparate impact practice or policy has a disproportionately adverse effect on members of the protected class as compared with non-members of the protected class. Negligent retention, Employees can be held liable to employees, customers, and others for negligence in the retention of an employee who presents a safety risk to others. And then defamation, making untrue statements about a person which damages his or her reputation, which results in an injury. And then we have retaliation. So retaliation, it's an adverse employment action taken because an employee complained about discrimination, harassment, or other violations of an employment law. Federal law prohibits an employer from retaliating against employees who exercise their rights under various laws, including the ADA and your FMLA. <clears throat> it's always a good practice to consult with a labor attorney when deciding to terminate an employee who may be protected under the various state and federal employment laws. Let's talk about some of those social media concerns. We wanna make sure that we have a disciplinary form and process in place. Um, excuse me, we wanna make sure that we have um, a policy in place that does speak about social media. And we're gonna talk about some of those concerns. And so we talk about postings that may be considered protected concerted activity under the NLRA which is your National Labor Relations Act. Um, what is a protected concerted activity? Well, that concerted activity is a legal protected class of actions when two or more workers act together to better their pay or working conditions. This activity can happen with or without a union, making it a very, very common in the workplace. Some examples of protected concerted activity are talking with coworkers about working conditions, joining with coworkers to demand better working and safer conditions, bringing group complaints to an employer's attention, or organizing a union. While concerted activity is widely protected, there's gonna be incidents where your actions can remove the protections granted in the NLRA. Um, making knowingly false or deliberately offensive claims against your employer will not be protected. Further, publicly dis disparaging dis statements about your employer's business are not covered by the NLRA unless they're connected to a specific labor dispute. There are concerns. So many states have laws in place or that the laws are pending that prohibit employers from requesting or requiring access to social media accounts of an employee. Uh, protecting employees from discrimination based on their off-duty conduct, political opinions, or religious beliefs. <clears throat> Excuse me. The newly amended Right to Privacy in the Workplace Act of 2020 makes it illegal for companies to ask or require employees to use personal social media profiles to join their employers' online accounts. Rulings by the National Labor Relations Board state employers cannot restrict 
what employees post on their own accounts. So lastly, I will leave you with this. Words matter. So make sure to use the right ones for disciplinary documentation. I cannot even begin to tell you how incredibly vital this is. And though you may think a sternly worded warning will inspire change, the wrong words could be taken as a personal attack, creating the exact opposite reaction that you initially intended. I'm going to provide you with seven common mistakes that leaders make when addressing employee issues in writing. They are, number one, labeling without substance. Words such as crazy or lazy or bad attitude or hysterical. Those are subjective, especially without examples to substantiate your claim. It's best to avoid them altogether. Instead, Use statements to illustrate how an employee was out of line. William was told on two previous occasions that his tardiness was unacceptable. The employee handbook clearly states business hours are. So be concise and non-judgmental. Number two, criticizing employee intent. Unless you're inside the employee's head, you don't know for sure that they don't take their job seriously. Intent is largely indefensible in a courtroom, so avoid using it. Instead, state examples of the activities that counter the desired behavior. Number three, focus on the person instead of the behavior. You may have a personal opinion about an employee or an employee's actions, but keep those away from any disciplinary documents. Concentrate on the incident or behavior. Stick to the facts. Don't include opinions about the employee or comment on personality traits. Instead of saying, well, Karen's wardrobe is just not stylish, describe specific instances when her attire didn't follow the corporate dress code. Number four, overusing inflammatory or embellished language. Two words you should always refrain from and never use, always and never. Lest you can illustrate with proof that the employee always clocks out early or never gets to work on time. We wanna avoid statements like this. Exaggerating even innocently could damage your credibility if you're called to testify. Number five, using language that illustrates uncertainty on the manager's behalf. Avoid phrases such as, well, it would appear or it would seem likely employees and a courtroom might think you don't have firsthand knowledge of the issue. Instead of saying, it appears you don't understand how to use our scheduling software, you might wanna say, you've missed three shifts in the past month due to not signing into the scheduling software at the beginning of each week. Number six, forgetting to include consequences for continued undesirable behavior. Every disciplined document must include the actions you will take if the employee doesn't address the concern moving forward. Clearly outline the violation, set a time frame for addressing it, and state what will happen if the problem isn't resolved. For example, we will review your progress in one month. In the event the issue persists, a final warning will be drafted and added to your file. It's wise to have a discipline policy as a part of your employee handbook to ensure all employees are aware of the process in the event disciplinary action is necessary. It's also a good idea to direct employees to the policy when, this, when they step out of line so they are reminded about the policy. And last but not least, number seven, disciplining without offering corrective suggestions. So we wanna remember the goal, the goal is to encourage employees to move to a desired behavior instead of attacking them for their shortcomings provide specific examples when employees exhibited undesired behavior, and then show what the desired behavior is, along with suggestions about how they can progress in the right direction. So for example, the employee handbook says, smoking is not permitted inside the building. Therefore, if you wanna smoke during your breaks, please use the designated areas outside. All right. So 
I want to thank you all so much for hanging out with me, uh, knowing it's at the end of the year and we're all probably swamped with 20,000 tasks that need to be wrapped up in the next week. Um, I do want to wish you all an amazing rest of the week, a safe and peaceful holiday, and here's to much success in the coming year. If you would like to learn more about MP and our organization, give us a shout. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Thanks so much, Donnie. To learn more about MP's HR services for 2023 and more, I did drop a link into the chat that will connect you with an MP team member. You can also visit our website or call 978-338-3354 for even more information. Be sure to join us in the new year for our upcoming webinar, 2023 Employee Handbook, Compliance and Best Practices. Visit our website to register and to see the full calendar of upcoming events and available resources. We will be sending out a recording of today's webinar with the presentation slides this afternoon. Thank you and have a happy day.